So this is a, it's a real privilege and a treat for me to be able to be here. I, in my capacity at uh, the Templeton Foundation, I get to go to a lot of academic conferences and hear lots of talks and interact with a lot of interesting people and read tons of papers and, uh, and do the sorts of, in that capacity, doing a lot of the things I did as a faculty member. But I don't get to write much and I don't get to give many talks. Um, so I'm kind of out of practice. So I'm glad it's kind of a small group because you know I don't know how this is going to go. But um, uh, but the, one of the really cool things in this role is uh, because we do grant making across so many different disciplines and religious traditions and regions of the globe. You are seeing you're seeing so many different ideas. And um, as I've been in this role, I've thought, boy, it'd really be great to write something on this, that, or the other thing, but I don't have any time for that. So when I get an opportunity to do something like this, it's a chance for me to pull together some threads from some of the things that are happening, I think, on kind of the frontiers, um, both philosophically and um, scientifically, and try out some new things. So here's my warning. This is some new things. And I know I have not thought carefully through all the different things I want to talk through here today. But I think there's some really interesting ideas in here. And so this is a chance to kind of throw some stuff at you and get your reaction. I mean, I'm really curious to see what you think about the lines of argument I want to lay out in this, um, in this talk. So with that said, here goes. It's a little bit bright on my screen, so I might move around a little bit so I can see what I've got up here. Um, but I hope that uh, you find this to be interesting. So um, one of the things that Templeton does. There are many different types of things that we fund, but one of the things we do is to fund research that looks at the extent to which um, research findings from the academy either comport with or are in tension with um, religious perspectives. And this is something that we support in a variety of different religious traditions, Christianity, Islam, Tibetan Buddhism, and so on and so on. And of course, we all know that in some cases, the things that we find in the world, what not even deliverances of academic research, are just in tension with faith traditions. So the massive amount of suffering that we see in the world just raises serious intellectual and practical problems for theists, for example. But there's other sorts of data that is concordant with, or maybe even indicative of, a theistic account of the world. So I assume many of you are familiar with work that's been done in recent years on the notion of cosmic or cosmological fine-tuning, where the idea is that um, certain laws and constants that govern the physical cosmos seem to be balanced on a razor's edge in just the ways that are necessary to make life, or maybe even intelligent life, possible. And to many, this sort of improbable balancing act calls out for some kind of an explanation. And for many people, the idea that the universe was intelligently designed is a really good explanation explanation for that, and in fact, maybe better than any alternative explanation, if there is, even is any alternative explanation. But when it comes to, um, to evolution, things are just so much more chaotic and contingent, and uh, evolution seems to be driven, at least this is the standard story, by these undirected random processes that don't have a direction or an aim, um, and so there seem to be intention with the theist's claim that the world is designed to produce intelligent life and specifically, life that manifests the image of God. So in this, uh, the few minutes we have together this morning, I want to argue the, to the contrary, that the environmental constraints that were in place during human evolution might display something along the lines of fine tuning. That's a, um, I wasn't sure whether I really wanted to frame it that way, but I'm just go, I'm going for it here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it out that way and see what you think. And um, so the idea is that there are these constraints in the environment that channel evolution in particular directions and in directions that ultimately lead to the emergence of beings that manifest the divine image as it's described in scripture. Okay, so thinking about the divine image has uh, really changed a lot over the last half century in theology. And there are many reasons for that. Um, but I think one of the reasons that theologians have begun to rethink the divine image is because they think that there are scientific reasons to do that. Um, so, you know, we'd once thought that there were many characteristics, largely cognitive or psychological characteristics, um, that were distinctive of human beings, characteristics that non-human animals, which from now on I'm just going to refer to as animals. Um, when I say animals, I mean non-human animals. And that list included things like phenomenal consciousness, or theory of mind, or abstract thought, or language, or inclinations towards altruism. These are all characteristics that, at one time, um, were thought to be unique to humans. But as 
research has continued in evolution and human cognition or animal cognition and animal behavior, it's clear that many animals display these characteristics or at least proto versions of them as well. And so I think some in the theological community have thought this attempt to try to characterize the divine image in terms of traits, that's just the wrong, the wrong way to go. Um, in addition, one of the things we've learned from evolution is that um, speciation takes place in ways that are incremental. So as evolution progresses, there are incremental changes from generation to generation. And when these changes are significant enough, and what that means, what significant means biologically is actually a matter of dispute, but when those changes become significant enough, then we can regard a population as being a new species. Uh, but the problem is this incremental change that leads to the emergence of new species means that the characteristics, the dividing line between one organism and another, between human beings and their ancestors is just vague or fuzzy. It's not sharp in the way that you'd want it to be if you were going to define uh, the divine image in terms of these traits that are distinctive of Homo sapiens alone, right? Something like that. So you've got this worry about, you know, as we look at traits that distinguish us, it doesn't really look like there are any, and when you think about evolution, it looks like the lines are all fuzzy and vague, and so that's a good reason maybe to think that we shouldn't define um, the divine image in terms of these characteristics or traits. So it's led um, Christian theologians to look for alternative accounts. And I should say, um, if you know anything about this literature, uh, that's not the reason that theologians say they're going to look for these other accounts. And it may only be at one constraint that's operating in the background. For many of them, they think that these alternative accounts are ones that just uh, emerge from uh, a reasonable reading of the pages of scripture. Um, but on these alternative uh, conceptions, um, well, I guess I should say first. So the view that traits are what define uh, the divine image is oftentimes called the structural view in, in theology. And so here the idea is that these traits, traits which usually are, have something to do with the human mind, are, are what constitute the image of God and which in certain way mirror important characteristics of God. Um, so for example, Christian dualists, um, a view that I think we'll be talking about a bit tonight at the, uh, at the panel, uh, Christian dualists hold this view that humans are distinctive because we have or have as one of our parts an immaterial substantial soul that accounts for some of these unique traits, things like consciousness and language and abstract thought. On the other hand, there are um, other types of non-physicalist conceptions of the human person that have had an important uh, role in Christian theology. Um, one view that's known as hylomorphism, it's the view that was held by Aristotle and by thinkers like St. Thomas Aquinas and those who stand in their lineage. Um, their view was that um, human beings have two parts, a material part and a formal part. They're not actually distinct substances, but they interact in such a way that together they jointly form the human person or human nature. And it's in virtue of having both of these parts or components that we're able to manifest these traits or characteristics. Um, but these arguments I gave you before that there aren't any good distinctions, I think have led to these alternatives. And the alternatives are usually uh, going to the following labels, functional, relational, and then there's a another alternative that's sometimes called the dynamic or the eschatological view. So on the functional view, human beings uh, bear the divine image um, because God has conferred on human beings a certain functional role in creation. And maybe that functional role is to exercise dominion or to be stewards or some other function. But the idea is it's not traits. It's that God has said, you will play this functional role in the created order. And it's as a result of that that you have bear the divine image. Uh, on the relational view, uh, the idea is that we bear the divine image because of our unique relationship with God, um, this, uh, our, our salvific relationship and other types of relationships that theologians have articulated that we have with God. That's what makes us in the image of God. And if God had chosen to have that sort of relationship with an alligator or a fruit fly or an eagle or an elephant or whatever, then those things would have borne the divine image. But in fact, these relationships are relationships that God has distinctively with us. And others have said that in this, on this relational view that it's, perhaps it's not our relationship with God, but it's our relationship with one another. So that God has given us the capacities to relate to each other in certain ways, love and friendship. That's what constitutes the divine image. And then on this last alternative, which I'm calling the dynamic view or the eschatological view, um, the divine image here is thought as a divinely given goal to be realized in the eschatological future. So in this view, the image of God isn't something that's entirely held or completed at the beginning of human history. 
uh, but it's our telos, or an end, that's completed in the future. And uh, so the image of God here is um, originating and being rooted not in the first Adam, but in the second Adam in, in Christ, and in the glorification of humanity in Christ. That's this, uh, another view. So, um, as I said, those are oftentimes characterized as alternatives to the structural view. One reason to be skeptical that they really count as alternatives um, is because it looks like uh, to be able to do these other things, that is to have this function or to be able to have these relationships or to be able to accomplish this telos, you need certain characteristics. So in order to play the functional roles, to have these relationships either with God or with other creatures, there have to be other characteristics that you have. So you can't completely escape the structural view even if you embrace one of these alternatives. And so I think even as you think about how different ways of thinking about the divine image, ultimately you're led back to this question, are there ways in which human beings are distinct from other animals? And as you look at what's been done in the last 20 years in a variety of different scientific fields, I think the pendulum has swung back in the direction of saying that pretty uncontroversially yes, human beings really are distinctive from other animals and in important ways. And I don't, this is a message I think frankly that just hasn't gotten out. I think if you ask the average well-educated person, whether they're in the academy or outside of the academy, are humans distinctive in any important way? Generally speaking, they would say the answer is no. But for scientists who work on this question, I think they would say the answer is now uncontroversially yes. And I wanna run you through some of the reasons why they think that. Um, I mean, a Stanford primatologist, Robert Sapolsky, has said, some of you may know him, no friend of religion or Christianity for sure, um, while all animals are unique, humans are unique-ier, he says, and I think that's, that's right. So what is it we're learning? What is it we're learning that's led to this conclusion? I think what we're learning is that evolutionary processes that operate at the biological level, but even more importantly at the cultural level, um, have significantly shaped human beings in ways that make us distinctive. So, uh, before I go any further, let me um, just supply as a bit of background information that as we think about human evolution, it's important to recognize, at least as we understand it now, that it unfolds in three distinct stages. So the first stage of human evolution takes place between five million and three million years ago, and during that period, human evolution is really governed by strictly biological evolution, that is phenotypic variation and selection. Those are the primary pressures that influence the trajectory of our, our lineage. But between three million and about 40,000 years ago, uh, a different sort of pressure takes over, something that's now come to be called gene culture coevolution. And here the idea is that human beings are changing the environment within which they live, and that in turn changes the selective pressures on them. So it's not just reacting to pressures that have to be present in the environment, it's pressures that are created by technological enhancements that human beings create. And I'll give you some illustrations of that. So I think this research is super cool, really interesting. Um, so for example, the invention of cooking allowed human beings to consume a wider variety of foods than we could consume before and to partially pre-digest those foods. That's one of the functions of cooking. And this allowed our ancestors to, ancestors to extract more caloric benefit from the foods that they were collecting and to devote less energy towards digestion. So you got more out of what you ate and it took less energy to digest it. And as a result, um, human beings have a digestive tract that's significantly smaller than you would expect for other apes of our size. Our stomachs are only a third of the surface area we'd expect for a primate of our size. Our colons are only 60% of the mass that you'd expect for uh, primates of our size. Um, and this improvement in digestion allowed for a greater allocation of resources towards um, support of larger brains and the consumption of caloric resources for, um, for our brains. So for us, about 20 to 25% of our energy expenditure goes towards powering our brains, where it's only eight to 10% for other primates. So the, these were changes that were allowed to take place in our genetic makeup and in our phenotype because we changed practices that allowed our bodies to mo be modified in that sort of way. Right? We're kind of facilitating our own evolution in that way. Um, during the third and most recent period, this 40,000 years to the present, uh, the abilities that we have acquired have really been driven by the accumulation of massive amounts of technology and know-how. So it's not so much biological evolution or even gene cultural evolution. It's evolution precipitated by cultural practices that we internalize and modify. 
Um, and so this uh, type of thing is called cultural evolution, and um, I'll explain why I think that's important in just a few minutes. Uh, but during this, during this period, human beings were able to harness a variety of innovations and discoveries that brought about many of the characteristics that I'm going to argue now we think are distinctively human. Things like language, altruistic cooperation, mentalizing, and theory of mind. These are all the consequences, I'm going to claim, of cultural evolution. So each of these stages accounts for different elements of our human constitution. And what we'll see is that gene culture coevolution and cultural evolution are, are massively important to explaining the emergence of human distinctives. Okay, so as I mentioned at the beginning, I wanna look at the question of how we should understand the divine image in light of some interesting work that's emerged from the sciences. But I wanna do that by taking a more a theological route. And I wanna do that by asking three questions. And here they are. So the first question is, according to scripture, what are we created for? That's the first question, and I'm going to give you a very fast, facile answer that um, you may or may not agree with. Second is, uh, what traits would we have to have in order to play those roles? And then the third wildly speculative question is, how do you make a universe that spawns such creatures? Okay, so those are the three questions that I'm going to answer in the three parts of the talk that remain. All right, so let's begin with the first question. I think that what's, uh, um, among the things that we find, uh, that human beings are created for in scripture to stand out. So the first is we're created to be stewards. In Genesis 1, 28, scripture affirms that uh, humans are to be fruitful and increase in number, to fill the earth and subdue it, to rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and every living creature that moves on the ground. And this notion of stewardship, I think, is something that's become to be increasingly recognized by the church in recent years. And um, I think that we see that being stewards of creation is one of the things that God created us human beings to do in a distinctive way. Uh, second, scripture affirms that human beings are created to uh, and find our flourishing in relationships of love and friendship with God and with one another. And you see that in many, many places, perhaps most famously in Matthew 22, 37 through 39. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So these, so my claim is there are two things specifically that we're created for. One is to be stewards and the other is to be lovers. So now the second question, what sorts of creatures would we have to be? What sorts of traits would we have to have in order to be that, to be stewards and lovers? So let me take them one at a time. We'll start with stewards. So stewards are charged with caring for or maintaining or um, promoting the integrity or well-being of something. So as stewards of creation, or at least our terrestrial corner of it, it seems like right now that's the only part of creation over which we can exercise stewardship, um, stewardship requires a couple of things. So first, it requires an ability to inhabit wide-ranging natural environments. We have to be able to spread around, spread out across this terrestrial globe. And the second is, it requires the ability to exercise causal powers that can harness or control the natural world. Those are at least two things we need to be able to do in order to be stewards. So while, while it might be the case that now our causal powers can extend far beyond the location of our body because we have things like drones and satellites and lasers and so on, that's only recently been the case. Prior to that, exercising stewardship, exercising causal power over the environment required local presence. We had to be physically there. And one of the features that makes human beings unique, at least among multicellular organisms, is our ability to survive in environments across the globe. And that might sound like it's not very interesting. It might sound unremarkable, but it's really, really remarkable for a multicellular organism to have that ability to spread out across all of these environments. As a relatively weak and undersized ape, our ability to live in extreme environments is truly a, a marvel. So what is it about human beings that allowed us to migrate out of Africa and to create stable populations in almost every environment across the planet? So you might say, well, it's because we're really smart. It's just our remarkable intelligence, right? That's all. That plus our oversized brains, we're the most intelligent species. So, of course, as we move out of Africa and spread around, it's just our smarts that allowed us to do it. But if as anyone stuck outside in the cold without a coat knows, just having an IQ isn't good enough. Like, that doesn't do it for you. Um, instead, what you need are 
um, certain kinds of know-how, certain kinds of tools, certain kinds of technologies that have been accumulated over multiple generations. Right? These aren't things that you invented yourself. I, I'm just going to wager that most of you wouldn't have a clue how to make the coat that you wear when you go outside that keeps you from freezing, or the shoes that are on your feet, or the, the glasses that you wear, the contact lenses that you have. All these things are things you would have no idea how to create on your own if you had to. Um, these are things that, you are, that are passed along to you through your culture, um, through something that's called social learning. So um, what it turns out we're very, very good at, far better at than any other species, is copying and learning. So this sort of know-how, the, the sort that we acquire through copying and learning, um, has emerged as the, uh, from our ability from what we can teach to and learn from one another. And what, em what emerges from that is something that um, cultural evolutionary theorists call cumulative culture. So this accumulation of technology, know-how, tools, and so on, this cumulative culture allows us to learn how to build structures or clothing that protects us from the threatening elements of the environment, to process foods that would otherwise be poisonous, to avoid predators that would be deadly, and things like that. All of these things are based on technologies and know-how that we've inherited through our culture, and it's this that allows us to survive in all these different environments around the globe. So this crucial ability to acquire, transmit, and build upon cumulative culture, that uh, arguably is the most or one of the most distinguishing characteristics of human beings, and one which explains why we can do this, why we can inhabit environmental niches that are so variable. And, um, so this explains, I would say, many of the traits that are characteristic of human beings. Cumulative culture I is the trick that allows us to internalize those things that we know in order to do most of the things that we do with most of the tools that we have. And it, it, indeed, we're very, very good at teaching and copying. This uh, sort of know-how, along with many other features of our environment that emerge from what we teach to and learn from each other, this is cumulative culture. And here, this includes knowledge of how to build structures and, um, sorry, I'm going backwards, process food and all these other things that, are, that we're very good at. But this brings us to the second requirement, the ability to um, exercise causal powers that go beyond what we can get at just by flexing our biceps and triceps, right? In addition to, um, in addition to being able to have the ability for cumulative culture, in order to, to steward the powers of nature, we need to do something more than what we can do just by flexing our muscles. So how can we, how can we do that? And the answer is almost all the causal power that we exercise in the world, if you think about this, it's mediated through two types of cumulative culture. The various tools or products that we have, cars, fire, fertilizer, vaccines, rifles, satellites, lasers, and things like that, or knowledge that we've acquired through processes of social learning. So that's how to cook, how to use a lever, how to yoke an ox, how to construct an airfoil, how to build a diesel engine, and so on and so on. We, these are all technologies that we've learned. And without these, um, or the cumulative knowledge conferred on us by our predecessors, we could only affect what our, what our muscles can do, and that's not very much. So social learning is the key trick for exercising this power. It's a special sort of learning, and it seems to be unique to humans. So there was this, a landmark study done, I'm not sure if you can see, this is Michael Tomasello now of Duke and um, Esther Herman. They tested uh, children, chimps, orangutans on a battery of 38 cognitive tests, looking at their abilities related to spatial, quantitative, causal, and social learning. And here are the results. So you can see when it comes to spatial reasoning, quantitative reasoning, causal reasoning, um, it, humans aren't especially better at it than these other primates, but when it comes to social learning, the differences are dramatic. They are dramatic. So, um, our ability to create, internalize, and pass along cumulative culture is something we just don't find in any other, any other creature, even our nearest um, primate relatives. And what, one of the things this leads to is a disposition on our part to favor copying and imitative learning even over um, uh, reasoning on our own. So even in cases where it looks like we ought to trust our own reasoning, 
we have this tendency to follow the behavior of the majority or of high prestige individuals. And there's massive amounts of research that support this. But I thought I'd just show you one little video clip, clip that I think is pretty interesting. This is some research done by Andy Whiten at St. Andrews. Let me see if I can get this to go now. This is very small. Oh, come on. No, no button. There is a little button I have to push, but it's exceedingly tiny. All right, there we go. Oh, can we turn the audio off? Uh, well, I'll tell you what's going on here while the audio is going on. So you can see there's this metal box, and what the experimenter doing is doing is going through a bunch of steps, right? Pushing the cylinders, tapping the top of the box, and then opening the door in the front. And what happens is a little starburst comes out. We've got to go the other way, sound-wise. <laughs> So you, when you show the chimp the steps that you need to go through in order to get the treat, they can learn the routine and do the very same thing. But then what they did was they created a transparent version of this box, which made it clear that sliding the cylinders and tapping the top of the box had nothing to do with getting the reward, right? And so then they did the same experiment again with chimps and with, the, with children. And when you did it with the chimps, they could see that pushing the cylinders and hitting the stick in the top of the box didn't make any difference. They just went straight to the end, opened the door and pulled the starburst out. But when they did the experiment with kids, both with the, with the metal box and with the transparent box, even though anybody looking at this box could see that pushing the cylinders and tapping the top of the box had nothing to do with getting the rewards, the kids still went through all the steps. Right? You can see that there's a, there's a barrier there that prevents the stick from doing anything that has to do with getting the door open to get the treat. But it didn't matter. The kids would routinely follow the a pattern displayed by the experimenter in order to get the result, even though it turns out that it wasn't, wasn't necessary. And this isn't something you need experimental evidence to, um, to demonstrate. Sorry, let's see if we can get past this. Um, it's something that you would just expect to find in an organism that operates in an environment where sex, success or failure depends on internalizing cumulative culture. Right? If you are the sort of creature that survives depending on whether or not you can internalize cumulative culture, then the smart thing to do is to copy others, especially the majority or high prestige individuals who you might have good reason to think have been successful culturally. And so we are really, really wired to do that. And in fact, in many cultures around the world, you'll find that internalization of cumulative culture happens not by explaining to those who are internalizing how it works. Like we cook the food this way because it neutralizes the poison. It's just conferred on the next generation by explaining this is how we process this food because that's how we do it. That's a sufficient explanation for why you should do it that way. Um, so in, in, uh, in animals, um, we do see some displays of culture. You might say beavers creating beaver dams. That's a sort of culture that gets passed along from one generation to another. And even so social learning of a certain sort. So bees can, through a dance, demonstrate the location of food to other bees. But in human beings, the, uh, the amassing and transmission of uh, cumulative culture is different in three important respects. So first, um, it's different because the quantity and variety of cultural products and knowledge that we have and transmit to subsequent generations is just massively, massively larger than any other type of organism. Second, and relatedly, our ability to copy or learn from others spans a much wider repertoire, including every cognitive and motor activity over which we have volitional control. Every such activity has the ability to inform cumulative culture and to be passed along to subsequent generations. And third, we're far more committed to the practices that make the accumulation of transmission and uh, the accumulation and transmission of culture possible. And again, this sort of thing, is, you know, uh, we see it in other ways as well. Um, I'm going to hold on to this for a second. Um, the notion of celebrity endorsements. That, that's a puzzling phenomenon, right? So why should you care if Rihanna wears Pumas or Willem Dafoe likes Snickers? I mean, it's so bizarre. Right? And yet, marketers uh, know for sure that if they can get those celebrities to um, endorse their products, you will buy more of them. And that is really strange until you realize that we're creatures that are driven by cumulative culture and have this innate drive to imitate the behaviors of high prestige individuals in certain respects. Um, very strange, and yet, in another sense, not strange at all. Um, 
Well, I'm not really sure it's worth going through this graphic in detail. It's really an attempt to show you how cumulative culture, by imitation, can lead to the formation of certain um, cultural practices that are highly adaptive. So, um, uh, the idea here is, in, well, I'll just do this quickly. So, in generation one, you might have um, one of our Australopith ancestors recognize that they could they find a certain stick and they can use that as a way of mining for termites in a termite mound, right? And in the next generation, others see one of their um, uh, colleagues doing this, their confraternals doing it, um, and they see that one of the sticks has been sharpened. And they think that's something that was done intentionally. It actually wasn't, it was just accidental, but they have a sharpened stick. Another one gets a stick that's actually hollow and can be used as a reed straw, so you can actually extract um, water from hidden sources and tree trunks and that sort of thing. And that actually gives that individual the ability to trek along the savanna because they can stop at various junctures and extract water that otherwise they couldn't. They could only go out for a short distance, now they can go out much longer. Well, in the second generation, one of the um, uh, members of this group gets a hold of one of the sharpened sticks and as it's poking around, um, it pokes into one of the termite mounds and accidentally hits a rodent that's in there, spears the rodent. And then this thing which was for the purpose of getting termites now becomes a rodent spear. Right? And um, so then by the time you get to generation three, you have some who have uh, these rodent spears and they happen to notice that when they spear rodents, there are tracks that actually lead into the termite mound that indicate that a rodent is in there. So now they learn that tr there's a way of tracking to find out which termites uh, mounds are best to poke your spear into. And ultimately, by the time you get down to this final generation, you find that you can have sharpened, hollow spears that allow you to make long treks across the savanna, looking not only for termites, but for rodents, and stopping along the way to refresh by finding a drink of water. And um, so you might call this the, the, um, the savanna hunting package of characteristics. Right? These are characteristics that you wouldn't have had as an individual had you not been able to inherit these forms of culture from one generation to the next. And it looks like this is in fact how a lot of human, important human capacities have emerged and culturally. Uh, so evolutionary biologist Kevin Leyland um, recently wrote this book called Darwin's Unfinished Symphony, which brings together a lot of this really fascinating research, sums it up by saying, for hominins to evolve from a chimpanzee-like creature to homo sapiens took approximately six million years, but in the last 10 to 12,000 years of cultural evolution, humanity has been to the moon, split the atom, built cities, compiled encyclopedic knowledge, and composed symphonies. And we can do that because of this, um, this trick that we have in, uh, internalized of social learning. Okay, so let's remember where we are in this discussion. First I asked, um, what should we infer about the purposes for which we're created from scripture? And I said there were two things. Um, one is that we're stewards and another is that we're lovers. And my second question is what characteristics do we have to have in order to be able to do this? And so in order to be stewards, I said we had to be able to produce cumulative culture. And it looks like we have exactly the characteristics that are necessary um, to be able to do that. The social learning and innovation on social learning characteristics that are necessary in order to be stewards. To inhabit the world across many, many environments and to um, invent tricks um, of cumulative culture that allow us to steward the natural world. So now we turn to the second, um, lovers. What characteristics do we have in order to be, what, would he, what characteristics would we have in order to be capable of love and friendship? And so that first requires that you have some account of what you think love is. Um, as you might imagine, there's a great deal of philosophical and theological literature on this topic as well, uh, which I'm not gonna go through in any detail. I'm just gonna adopt one particular account. And, um, if you know anything about the philosophical literature, this is a, a hybrid of two accounts uh, developed by Eleanor Stump and another fellow named Bennett and Helm. So I'm gonna explain this account of, account of love in terms of two people, Sam and Laura. And on this account, um, Sam loves Laura when Sam desires the flourishing of Laura for her own sake, and Sam desires union with Laura. Those are the two characteristics that are sufficient for a relationship of love between two individuals. Um, sorry, wrong button. So on this account, Laura's, flour Laura's flourishing depends on her acquiring certain things that she desires, things that are um, conducive to her flourishing. And Sam loves Laura when he desires her flourishing and the fulfillment of those desires that she has for her sake desiring the fulfillment of those desires that are conducive to her flourishing for her sake, 
on the one hand. Um, and when he has that, when he displays that characteristic, what Sam wants to do is to work together with Laura to acquire those goods that are conducive to her flourishing. So that's the first part. Um, and then the second is seeking union with. So on this account, in these union accounts, um, love with Laura requires not just desiring the things that are good for her and that are conducive to her flourishing and working together with her to achieve it, um, but doing it together with her in such a way that they jointly share the intentions to bring about those ends. So just wanting the good for another person isn't sufficient for love. That's just beneficence. Um, wanting the good for that other person and in endeavoring together with them to achieve it, that's the sort of thing that constitutes love. So I claim. So what are the requirements for love? Uh, for Sam to love Laura, first, Sam must be able to understand the things that, value, uh, that Laura values and desires. Sam must be able to align his intentions and desires with Laura's. And Sam must want to share these desires jointly with Laura. Those are the things, those are the characteristics you need to have to be able to engage in loving relationships as I'm characterizing it here. Okay, so now, what characteristics do you have in order to be, able, do you have to have in order to be able to do that? And I think there are five. Okay, so this, this now starts to be uh, important. So first of all, you have to have desires in order to engage in these loving relationships. You have to have an awareness of the desires of others. You have to have the ability to desire that the desires of others be fulfilled. You have to have an ability to desire that the desires of others be fulfilled for their sake. And you have to have the ability to form and act on joint intentions, to be able to work together with someone towards a common goal, okay? So what's interesting here is you progress through these list of characteristics. What you find is that you move from characteristics that many, many organisms have to, organi to uh, characteristics that arguably only, only human beings have. So we know that other organisms act on the basis of desires, that they have an awareness of the desires of others. Maybe they have the ability to desire that the desire of others be fulfilled. But if they do that, they only do that in cases where the cost to them is very, very low or zero. Right? They never do that when there's a great cost to themselves, as far as we know. But these other two characteristics, having the ability to desire that the desire of others be fulfilled for their sake, and having the ability to form and act on joint intentions, that looks like those characteristics are unique to us. So there are lots of similarities between humans and other primates. Um, but an important difference that is, except in very limited circumstances, the other great apes don't have the corresponding abilities that are necessary to genuinely cooperate with one another. So they do coordinate their behaviors. They will, for example, respect dominance st structures. They will join together in group defensive activities against neighboring groups. They'll form bands to improve the likelihood of their success against um, in intergroup competition. But they don't engage in behaviors that involve the seeking of the good of another or for acting on a joint intention, as far as we know. And this is in stark contrast to humans that do this thing, sort of thing, all the time. So from 12 months of age, you all surely have experienced this, a child will point to an empty place um, where something is usually located uh, to get an adult's attention, right? And when they do that, this, this involves a high degree of cognitive sophistication because what's going on there is the, this infant is jointly attending with you to that place of where something is absent and assumes that you know that that object belongs there and by pointing, assumes that you will know that she knows that the thing is missing and that she wants you to do something about it, right? That is cognitively very sophisticated and something we don't find in any of our primate relatives. So while other animals might engage in activities that show their intentions, right, their intentions to attack, for example, only humans use their communicative acts to engage with others to discern their thinking, even outside of strategic contexts. Only we do that. As a result, human communicators seem uniquely able to adopt what's sometimes called the second person perspective, to see the situation from the standpoint of someone else. So from a young age, children are able to mentally represent the thoughts and intentions of another agent and can anticipate their goals and objectives and can engage in non-self-serving behavior 
helping them to achieve those goals. So let me show you another. This is a really fun video. And again, the behavior you'll see here isn't surprising at all. But what you're going to see is there was actually a part of this experiment prior to the part that I'm going to show you. And by the way, if you guys want to move, you're still welcome to because I can see the sun is like right there. But um, so uh, in the first part of the experiment, um, the experimenter walks in with a, with a bunch of books or files and there's a, there's a cabinet with the doors open, okay? And the experimenter puts the, um, puts the folders of the books in the cabinet and closes the door. Okay, so what you're going to see is the second part of the experiment. And this is an experiment that has been done many times with uh, other primates. And the behavior that you're going to see displayed by the child here is not displayed by any other primate ever. And notice there's no eye contact to signal that he wants the assistance of the child. Now this is an inset picture here, and you're going to see him dropping the keys down there. The experimenter's off to the right. Now he just puts his hand down. So I mean, we look at that and it's obviously very cute. Um, but what's going on there cognitively is obviously very sophisticated, right? You've got this child anticipating the aims and interests of this other individual and then engaging in this non-self-serving action in order to facilitate their goals. And what we have, I mean, the experiments have been done over and over again with non-human primates and they just don't exhibit this sort of behavior at all. So it looks like we uniquely have this ability to mentally represent the interests of others and then to put ourselves into a situation where we're endeavoring together with them jointly to bring about this, this uh, an end. All right, so we're at 39 minutes here. There's another really cool video I want to show you, but maybe I'll come back and do that later if I can. Um, but this sort of behavior we see exhibited over and over again, children able to engage in these what are now called joint intentional activities where they commit to work together to achieve goals on both of their behalves. And uh, I'll actually tell you what's going on in this. I won't show you the video, but there's a little bar that these two girls have to move up through this apparatus. And the idea is when they get to the top, they get this little um, device that they can take and put into a little box on the floor. And when they do it, it makes this noise, bring, right? So they kind of like doing this thing. And, um, but they have to work together to move the bar up. And as they do, the way the device is structured, the girl on the left is able to reach her hand through a hole in the plexiglass first and get her reward. And then the other girl says, hey, wait, wait, I haven't been able to get mine yet. Can we keep doing this until I get mine, right? And so they have to struggle to get it up to the top so that the second girl can get in hers. And when you put kids in this situation, they almost universally will help the other one so that each of them gets their reward. Put any kind of primate in this environment. If you know anything about primates, you'll know as soon as the first one gets their reward, that's it, game over. Like, it doesn't matter what happens with the other one. There's no help, no sharing, no joint intention. They don't care. Um, so it's just really fascinating to, to look at these experiments and what they show about what's distinctive about us. So what does this show? It shows that human beings and none of our nearest primate relatives have the full suite of mental powers needed to be able to engage in relationships of love and friendship. We, but not they, can desire that others achieve their goals for their sake and can engage in joint intentional activity. So that's actually Sam and Laura, my son and his fiance. Uh, all right, so let's go to the last question. How do you make a universe that spawns these creatures? Okay, now here's the answer. We don't have any idea. Um, but it's kind of fun to speculate. So let's do a little speculating. So I think um, what you need to do in order to get a universe that spawns such creatures is the following. Um, to create beings capable of stewardship, they need to have two characteristics. First of all, they need to have precision gripping appendages. And second, they need to have big brains that are capable of cumulative culture. Those are the two things that you need. And for love, what you need is the ability to engage in joint intentional activity, and you need conditions that create something that um, biologists call obligate interdependence. So how do you have to structure an environment to get a creature that has all of those things? That's the question. All right. So um, we'll call this first, first part here the path to stewardship. So what conditions facilitated the emergence of stewardship? First, you need appendages that allow for precision grip. And when human beings were uh, tree dwellers, our, or our, and our ancestors were, tr were tr uh, tree dwellers, this was very difficult to do uh, because we needed our grip in order to hold on to trees. And we don't, didn't have the precision gripping abilities that emerged later in our, our, our lineage. So, um, Sometime between three and five million years ago, our primate ancestors transitioned out of trees into um, bipedal terrestrial existence. 
And this allowed the use of two-handed grip to do things other than hang on to the trees. It allowed us to not only manipulate the world and make tools, um, but it also allowed us to find tools that are just laying around. When you're in the tree, you don't find tools laying around because they fall down on the ground where you're not. Um, but it was just easier for us to find other things that were laying around and to figure out how to utilize them and to create tools with multiple parts. By around three million years ago, we see um, that fossils indicate that our fossil ancestors have now the ability to use tools and exercise what, what's now called precision grip. And so precision grip is the thing that allows us to do things like thread a needle, which no other primate can do, or even to craft stone tools, which other primates can't do. They can't craft stone tools. It doesn't mean they can't use tools, right? but there are certain kinds of tools they can't make. So unlike chimps and other, our other primate ancestors, we have um, our thumbs got a lot longer, um, they got wider, and the bone structure changed so that the attachment between the muscle in our thumb and the rest of our hand allowed our thumbs to be a lot stronger. Um, and that's what allowed for this precision gripping ability that allowed us to begin to start making a lot of tools. By the time we get to 2.6 to 2.4 million years ago, and by the way, in parentheses, it's just showing increased cranial size, which is the other thing that I'm claiming is important to having creatures capable of cumulative culture. Here we begin to see a wide range of stone tools that were available, so-called so -called Oldowan tools. And then 200,000 years later, brain size has now increased actually by 50% from what it was previously. And we also see uh, signs that tools are now being used for things like food processing. And you can see this in part because Jaw, tooth, and uh, tooth enamel are all decreasing. We don't need s such strong teeth or such big jaws anymore because the food is cooked and pre-digested um, in various ways. We also see the emergence of wooden tools around this period of time. And all of this in leads to increased nutrition, which again means that we have more food to draw on and again that we need to devote less resources towards digestion. So um, by the time we get to 1.8 million years ago, we have the emergence of Homo erectus, and Homo erectus um, cranial size is now up to 800 cubic centimeters. That's at 1.8 million years ago. And interestingly, during this period, you see other important gene cultural evolution changes. So um, two really interesting ones, one that has something to do with this topic, one that doesn't have anything to do with it, but still pretty cool, um, is that our shoulders and wrists began to evolve in ways that allowed for powerful throwing abilities. So you could do things like throw spears or throw rocks to knock pr uh, um, predators, uh, uh, sorry, prey down um, for scavenging and for warfare purposes. Um, all of our upper body changed in that way. Another really interesting thing that happened was the emergence of our ability to engage in distance running. So uh, aside from horses, human beings are allowed to run distances longer than any other mammals. And this is something that evolved, likely, as far as we know, for the purpose of um, persistence hunting, where we would chase prey uh, until they collapse. And this still happens, actually, in certain African cultures. And actually, this happens during the hottest part of the day, that they run for very long distances in very long periods of time because the animals that they're chasing can't run as long as they can. But in order to do that, we had to evolve certain kind of characteristics that the primates don't have. So we needed um, long legs, narrow hips, a large butt, and we needed to be able to sweat a lot, um, especially through our heads. And so all these characteristics emerge around that period of time. Interestingly, though, we're also really bad at water, water carrying capacity. So we would sweat a lot, but we were bad at carrying water. And it turns out that these capacities didn't actually evolve until we created water carrying devices. So it looked like the creation of water carrying skins and so on preceded our ability to engage in this persistence hunting and actually allowed us to then invent this new type of um, nutrition acquisition. Very cool stuff. Anyway, so what this evolutionary trajectory seems to show is that there was this set of conditions that was highly conducive to the emergence of creatures that would be capable of being, I claim, stewards over creation. Just the sort of conditions we would assume if the biblical picture of the function of human beings is correct. I think that's pretty cool. All right, so what about love? Well, at a minimum, for love of the sort described above to emerge, uh, we would have to have two things, as I mentioned. Intentional agency, the ability to act on intentions, and also um, situations that would foster what's called obligate interdependence. So these two things together would create the ability to have those five characteristics I mentioned on the earlier slide. So what is obligate interdependence? Obligate interdependence emerges when different organisms evolve patterns of behavior or activity 
that require dependence on others for their survival. And you see this in a variety of different cases in the biological world. Um, so one is that we need oxygen, and therefore we need plants that produce oxygen. Um, there's a mutualistic relationship between us and the plants, but um, that's not the way the word mutualism is used in, in biology. It's used instead to uh, explain relationships like the ones you see up here on the screen. So in the upper left, you have a shrimp and a goby fish, and they tend to inhabit the same burrow. It's a burrow that's dug by the shrimp, but the fish and the shrimp live in it together because shrimp are pretty much blind. And so when the goby sees an, a predator approaching, it swishes its tail and both hits the shrimp and they both recede into the, into the burrow. So they kind of live together in this mutual relationship, right? One digs the burrow and the other is the eyes to make sure that they can avoid, avoid predation. And you see this in a lot of places in nature. This is the clownfish and the sea anemone that have a similar, similar relationship. So in the context of human love, interdependence is more intimate still, since the relationship must be mediated by intentions, intentional action. So in order to coordinate obligate interdependent behavior amongst intentional agents, it has to be the case that we each understand each other's motivations and goals and can jointly attend to align these motivations uh, to seek common mutually intended ends. That's what we have to be able to do. I have to be able to understand your goals, you have to be able to understand mine. So why would this, how did this emerge evolutionarily? And I'm gonna go really quick because I'm way over time now. But the answer is, as we emerged from, uh, from tr tree dwelling, um, it was a period of global cooling, the radiation of other terrestrial monkey, monkeys, and a decrease in our ability to acquire the food sources that we typically um, capitalize on, fruit and other things like that. In addition, there were a large number of carnivores, tw t twice the number that we have in the current environment. And so human beings had uh, developed this ability to jointly forage together, collaborative foraging strategies like hunting large game. And in order to be able to, well, first of all, in order to be able to do that, you have to be able to engage in this ability of joint intentional activity. But once you become dependent on those kinds of foraging strategies, there's, there's no way to go back. There's no way to go back to any alternative. So you now have these obligate interdependent relationships forever. But what that required was the ability for me to understand what you're trying to signal to me and for me to align my interests with yours to bring about a common goal. It required the emergence of this new kind of cognitive capacity and it looks like it's a kind that only we have. Um, so this is entirely absent in other apes. Um, children can easily point to signal to you that there's something you should be doing that they recognize. But if you take an ape, and you, if you take an ape and point to a, a bit of food, they will follow your pointing and go to that bit of food. But if you have food in two buckets where they can't see and you point to one of the buckets, the apes will have no clue what you're doing because they can't internalize the idea that you're trying to give them information for their good. They will never follow your pointing to the bucket. And this is something that's totally natural for human beings. Okay, so what does this show? This is the end. I claim that it shows that our evolutionary history seems to have been set up in a certain way that pushed us down particular evolutionary paths that allowed for the emergence of creatures with critical mental abilities needed to engage in relationships of love and friendship. Uh, so we might see evolutionary history as being crafted for the purpose of yielding creatures made for just that reason, to manifest the divine image. And if that's right, rather than evolution being a series of accidents, contingent random occurrences, we should think of these environmental conditions as uh, set up in such a way to push us to be creatures of a certain sort, creatures who are able to and do in fact manifest the image of God. Thanks. <laughs>